Well, thanks for coming, everybody. Really appreciate you you making time for for this. And as you know, we're joined this evening by Dr. Leslie Payne. Um, Leslie, welcome. Thank you for for making time for us. Can you maybe start? But and and by the way, everyone, this is a, a conversation that you're welcome to join in. The the idea of Montessori Lives is that it's still a mentoring group the same way that teachers supporting teachers was but with a bit more structure so i'm inviting um some notable montessorians to join us each each time each fortnight and it's meant to be a conversation rather than a structured interview where i just do all the talking so if you think of questions please you know raise your hand digitally and and then there'll be plenty of time for other people to ask ask questions of our guest. Um, but maybe to start off with, Leslie, what was your what's your Montessori story? How did you discover Montessori? Oh well it was uh, I guess it was when I had my own daughter and um, I'd gone back to studying to be a teacher. Uh, so I was at Teachers College and there were all these books on the bottom shelf in the library there that had Montessori on them. All really old books, like really old, old binding and everything that they're right on the bottom shelf. And I didn't really take much notice of them, but I was talking to a friend and saying, oh, you know, I really wanted somewhere better for my daughter to go than the local childcare where she was. And they went, oh, have you thought of Montessori? And I made the connection to the books and did a bit of research and it really... And it just so happened that Beehive Montessori School was being established at that time. So they hadn't been established. There was a, what would you call it, a group, a action group that was setting it up, which I joined. Ooh. So, yeah, that was uh, 78, I think, 1978. <laughs> and, and what was your, your teaching background? Uh, I was a state school teacher at the time. Um, well, I, was, I wasn't at that time. I was a librarian and um, I'd had a daughter and wanted to go back to work and decided being a teacher librarian would be the thing to do. Um, and never got to the library, but I did become a teacher. So I was studying at that time at, at the Te Claremont Teachers College, it was called in those days. And what happened after you discovered Montessori? Where did you, did you? Uh, well, you as I said, I joined this group, which was really the group that started Beehive Montessori. And um, my daughter started there as soon as it opened. You know, I think it opened in the January, February, 78. Um, so I was like one of the parent board or whatever you want to call them. And my daughter went to the school. So. Yeah. And then, um, I, I did a correspondence course in Montessori to get a bit of a feel for it. And then they encouraged me to um, go to England. I went to England where I met Philippa and uh, we did the AMI course um, in, um, but what was it called? Something Gardens. You guys. It was, it was um, Hampstead Heath. Yeah, it, it had, had a name. Or Lindhurst Garden. It was called Lindhurst Gardens. Yeah. Lindhurst anyway. Gardens. <clears throat> we had Lynn Lawrence, a trainer in training at the time, remember? Yeah, and we had... Um, Ella Patel. Yeah, Hilda was the, the person in charge at the time. And um, the other girl, can't remember her name now, that's big now, what's her name? Lynn Lawrence. Who Lynn was Lawrence, there. she was, she was <laughs> just finishing her teacher training. I mean, her... Yeah apprenticeship or whatever the way they did it. Mm. And, Long time ago now. Yeah. And did you spend time teaching in the classroom? Which which level and and uh, well well we I mean we did teaching practice in England and then when I came back I, I worked at the Beehive Montessori School from then for about 17 years. So I taught all levels. Uh, well not high school. We didn't have a high school then but started in three to six and then did six to nine and then did nine to 12. Yeah. What have you most loved about being a Montessorian? 
Um, what have I most loved about it? Well, I think it's a very uh, natural, normal way to teach and a very normal, natural way for the kids to learn. So it's, it was certainly a lot easier than teaching in the state system where you're trying to teach, you know, 20 or 30 kids. Well, in those days, it was closer to 30, all at the same time around about the same age. And where you spent like 90% of your day just trying to keep them in their seats, let alone learning anything. Wow. So it was quite different, yeah. What were some of the challenges you, you found back then when you started out? Um, um, I'm not sure. I, I mean, I just enjoyed it. I don't know if I, I can't remember the challenges. There must have been some. Um, I know it affected my feet. I learned to wear proper shoes pretty quick because <laughs> you're on your feet all day. Um, staffing was always an issue. Um, staff, you know, like getting trained staff was always an issue. Um. What have you what have you least loved about being a Montessorian? Um, I mean, I, I guess in the very beginning, it was the the lack of um, a kind of respect in the wider educational environment. I mean, when we started the schools in the seventies, it was the time of the schools commission, so that's when a lot of Montessori schools started with the funding from innovation grants from the Schools Commission, which was operating at the time. But um, in the wider environment, people, I mean, a lot of the parents, a lot of the kind of schools were seemed to be very hippie. It was very much a hippie kind of thing. Yeah. So there was not a, the, the same kind of understanding or respect in the wider in the education environment. I don't find that now. Now, if you say, oh, you know, I'm a Montessori teacher, people know what you're talking about and they don't think you're running around in sandals and Indian beads. What do you think changed that? Um, I think the fact that a lot of uh, uh, people, well-known people, sent their kids to Montessori. I mean, in America there were a lot. In England, there was Charles and Diana. Um, it became more of a thing. And I, and I think in the, the universities, people um, started to look back at Montessori a bit and teach a bit of it in their classes. I know I used to get asked a lot to go and give talks at university about the Montessori approach and how it differed to more mainstream. Um, and I think the recognition I mean, a bit later on, the recognition that we got through the national curriculum and the um, uh, MAF were, really helped as well. Mm. Now, you you then later on, you started, you did some research that's become quite well known into cycles of school development. Oh, can in governance? Talk, yeah, can you talk a little bit yeah. about that? Well, I mean, like, so that was like early 2000s. So you've got anybody who's involved in Montessori schools for a long time will know, and particularly in those early days, most of the schools were parent run. So there was a lot of um, boom and bust in both the schools and in people's jobs. And I actually started my research because um, basically got elbowed out of behind and it was like a thing to do to try and work out why that happened and you know research something like a PhD for any of you who are thinking of doing it and I encourage you all but it does have to be something you really care about something that's kind of a bit personal in order to put a lot of work into it and it was so that's why I started really I was trying to understand what happened here how did that happen mm. And what does happen with schools? Um, well, I mean, if, if you look at my research, it's got like three, I think it's, it's a long time since I've looked at it, 
it's got, it's got a lot of different themes. The one you're talking about, the phases of development, um, I did put up, I did get out the chart. So I don't know if you want to share this with people, um, Mark, and then I can um, talk to it. Is that possible? Can you can you share screen? Uh, not at you the moment. Be, you should be able to. I think you have to give me permission. I think you should have permission now. Oh, share. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me just find it. Here it is. So basically, what what my research found in in the section that looked at phases of development. I also looked at dilemmas because a lot of these things, are, there's no black and white answer. There's, it's like, you know, making the best of situations. But as far as the phases of development go, most organisations, a lot of this comes from organisational theory. I've just adapted it to schools. Um, the a lot of the original research also looked at things like charities and not-for-profit organisations who really do the same kind of thing. But you start off in the very pioneering stage where like, everybody's doing everything and highly committed, high, um, put a lot of energy, a lot of resources, sometimes a lot of their own money into it. I remember somebody I interviewed from one of the Steiner schools, because I didn't just focus on Montessori schools, I looked at small independent schools and mostly. But one of them said to me, you know, we were really wanted to get the school off the ground. We were so, so committed we would sacrifice everything, including our children. It, it's sort of that kind of um, thing where you're so committed, you don't stop and think about if, if it's worth it or not. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's where it starts, and when so and the kind of so there's a lot of volunteers that it's not people's roles aren't clearly defined. People just do everything. So there's like yeah. a de facto executive um, roles overlap. That uh, rings a bell. I've been in schools like that. Yeah, I'm sure you've all been in places or not schools. You know, maybe the local sports club or as I said, a charity or something. Um, Decisions are made are on, on the run as you need them rather than a lot of forward planning. There's a lot of burnout of people, sometimes financial issues, sometimes clashes over philosophical approaches and so forth. So that's kind of the first phase. And it, then it starts to move from that collective to the sustaining where you start to get a few committees, you start to get things a bit more formalised. You take you you get the founding principal who's sort of you know put up on a bit of a pedestal, um, and then if things start start to go well, then a, a lack of trust develops and power struggles and all kinds of things happen, and usually the founding principal gets thrown out on their ear, mm -hmm. uh, and then so you can see the others. I'm not going to go through them all, but. Um, then they, everything gets super managed and everything gets really um, formalised and bureaucratic. And, and that's when a board takes over. And a board takes over and whatever. And then you, you get to the phase, which I think is where we got to about the time I left, so I'm not sure, but it's like um, a corporate phase where it's professionals get called in to do a lot of the decisions. Um, mm people start to get distance from the stakeholders it's all about long-term planning so you might get a principal who's not Montessori trained you, but you really very likely get a principal that's not Montessori trained because they want someone who's um, a professional <clears throat> yeah the staff start to get industrial because you know it's no longer we'll do anything we're asked it's like oh you know that's not part of my job right um and then and then if people get through that, it then becomes like almost just rubber stamping. People are not, they've lost their energy and they they don't care. It's not that they don't care. Unconsciously, they might not be prepared to put as much into it. So that they ask less questions. They don't really check on what the committees are doing or what the board's doing or what the principal's doing or what the teachers are doing. It just becomes like, just let's get through the day or the week or the year. And of course, that usually ends in disaster and you either close 
the school down and you end up back in the pioneering phase. It's sort of a cycle that goes around. And what, what's the last phase? Uh, the ratification phase where people are just like ratifying whatever the professionals say. So if the principal oh, says, oh, you know, we should do this, everybody just goes, oh, well, yeah, let's not rock the boat. Let's, let's just, you know, everybody knows what they're doing. We trust everybody. We'll just let them do it. And there's not that kind of same level of um, accountability or the same level of... Um, checking on things, mm. diligence and, and things like that. Do you think it's a cycle or can schools go backwards in that development? Um, oh, I'm sure they can probably go back. They, they might not go all the way back to the pioneer phase. That's true. They might, or they might not go right back to the collective pioneer phase, just the sustaining. Mm. It just depends. The, the research I looked at, uh, a lot of them did go back, but not all of them, no. That's true. Do you think these phases apply to public Montessori schools as well, or is it more? I'm not sure. We don't have many of those in Australia, Mark, so they weren't yeah. part of my um, part of my research. The only one we really had at that time was in South Australia, and it, that only had like a few Montessori classes, and they were not. My, all my research was in WA because that's where um, I could. I had the most contacts and I could talk to the most people. Mm. And WA at that time had the most schools as well. So what advice would you have for educators and, and leaders that based on your research who are, you know, involved in schools, particularly new schools? Um, I, I think just to be aware of the fact that these things happen over time and try and manage them a bit better rather than going through the phases I mean, you have to go through those phases. You have to start pioneering. It's not that the phases are wrong. It's just that if you look down at the bottom of that chart down here, the, the, the issues and crises are what you, you need to be aware of, What's gonna, what kind of issues and crises are going to come up out of that yeah. and try and manage them. Seems like this should be required reading for every Montessori leader. <laughs> Did, have you written a book or an article that, that is available for people? I, ha I have got an article. Um, I mean, my thesis is available. You just have to search it, I think, at Murdoch Uni. But yeah. that, it, it's long and you wouldn't want to read all of it. But I do, I do have an article. I can send it to you if you like. Yeah, that would be great. We can put it out. Um, what do you think are some of the big, big challenges that are faced now by education in general? Uh, education in general. Um, I think just trying to keep up with um, every new fad that comes over the principal's desk, uh, you know, whether it's technology or, uh, you know, the, the eights or the TRBs, they change the rules, like, you know, Suddenly everybody's got to do, in teacher training, they've got to do these, these number of units that, you know, it's all about reading and phonics now, which is fine yeah. by us. But, you know, there's always something coming over people's desk that's different. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as Montessori schools go, I think it's, it's because Montessori is getting less and less differentiated from the rest of education that, you know, there's a lot of the schools now, not all of them, there's kind of like different camps, but a lot of the schools are much more student focused, um, much more open to concrete materials and yeah. So the, the difference is, especially in the early years is not as great. So you think traditional education has gotten better over the years? Since yeah, you definitely. Yeah, definitely. There's still a lot of old fashioned people out there, but a, 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 if you go into most pre primaries or kindergartens, whatever you call them over your end of the woods, um, you would see some, it, it wouldn't look like a Montessori school in that everything would be out on the shelves, but a lot of what they do, would there would be a lot of similar activities going on. Mm. 
And what do you think differentiates Montessori from, from those traditional schools now? Now? Oh, definitely the materials. Mm -hmm. uh, but, I mean, they, they may have them on the shelf. Um, uh, someone was telling me the other day at one of our workshops that um, one of the people asked, you know, uh, uh, what... what oh, I can't remember, but what actually came up was that they ran different, on different days, they ran different approaches. So they might have a Montessori day, they might have a Steiner day, they might have a Reggio day. Yeah. And you think, oh, my God, <laughs> that's people not understanding <laughs> anything. Yeah. Do you think Montessori has things they can learn from some of those other approaches like Steiner and Reggio and democratic schools? And um. I, th I think, yeah, I, I mean, I, I definitely thought um, that we had a lot to learn about documentation from Reggio. Reggio uh, people document the kids' learning mm. in a different way to us, in a much deeper way. I think, you know, for a lot of Montessori teachers, they just tick boxes. Mm. You know, it's like a tick box way of recording and documenting stuff. There's much deeper stuff you can do than that. How do they do it in Reggio? Um, they do a lot of taking of photos of, of um, documenting the, the process a child gets to in understanding something. Yeah. They do things like recording conversations, um, yeah, using video recording, photographing as a way of like understanding what's really going on there. Mm. That's real authentic assessment. Yeah, it's authentic assessment. Reggio is pretty good at that. Um, you know, I've, I've done sort of back of the napkin calculations of how widespread Montessori is in Australia. And what I came up with trying to search out the best figures is that Montessori serves only about 12 hundredths of 1% of children in Australia and only about half a percent of schools in Australia are Montessori. Yeah. Why do you think Montessori is not more widely adopted in Australia and around the world? Uh, you want an honest answer? Yeah. I think AMI are too um, closed shop. They, they, they try and control everything and they don't want, you know, they, you know, if it's not authentic Montessori, we don't want to know anything about it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, uh, I think there needs to, you know, I think that's what's held it back over time. Mm -hmm. So the focus on purity over accessibility. Well, what is pure, Mark? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, 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 that's, that it's exactly that, you know, like, oh, but it's not real Montessori. Well, how do you know? Montessori got there by experimenting and by following the child, not by following a set of rule books. That's a good point. Yeah. So what do you think we can do to change this? Um, I think we already have. I guess that's what I'm saying in one way. I think Montessori has permeated itself out into more traditional education in a lot of ways and not enough of course I, mm. I guess the big thing that I think you know really still gets my back up when I go into traditional classrooms is the reward systems that they still use and I think teachers I mean I used to, I've, I've taught um, at Murdoch University uh, teacher uh, teachers in training and been out with them on prac and things like that at the universities, they're teaching them about why rewards don't work and, you know, better ways of getting children, motivating children, extrinsic, extrinsic. But as soon as they get out into the school where rewards are in place and that's what the kids expect and what everybody around them expects, they just yeah. fall in with the status yeah. quo. So there's still a lot of rewards going out there, far more than what you'd imagine. Um, and the other thing... Uh, I think is the the um, I mean obviously the materials, but but you can work around the materials. Just look at what they do in India with a lot of stuff. You don't have to have all the best materials. Mm. You do have to um, have that uh, 
belief in the in the children that they will get there that they want to learn and that you don't have to reward them or punish them in order to get them to learn that that's probably the biggest thing I thought of something else and now it slipped out of my mind it'll come back to me um it does seem like there's a, a real lack of trust in teachers, in teachers' own initiative, in traditional education, like particularly with state-based schools, you know, the, the state says, okay, we're all going to do this. Yeah. And so yeah. every school in the whole state has to do the same thing at the, more or less at the same time, and teacher initiative is really yeah. not yeah. allowed. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, maybe it's like that over there. Here, here not so much. Teachers still have, a, I mean, there's the, the national, well, the West Australian curriculum here. We all have our own, even though it's meant to be national. Mm. Um, and people have a lot of leeway within that, really. Um, and that's, uh, I mean, I, you probably, is anybody here from Melbourne? You've probably heard of the, I can't remember his first name, is it John Fleming? No, I haven't. Tell me about him. Um, anybody here from Melbourne? No? So I can't remember his first name. Sarah, right? Sarah's from Melbourne. Sarah, Sarah do you know the, Fleming, the guy with, with his Fleming approach? No. Anyway, there's a guy in Melbourne who, who was working in very disadvantaged schools in Melbourne. And he, um, he came up with this uh, approach to teaching disadvantaged children. And it's basically um, the old uh, lab approach. You know, it's like lock behavior modification, lockstep kind of stuff. And there are a lot of schools in WA, I don't know, if, not a lot. There's, a, there's some schools that have taken that up. So schools have got that full range of being from this very structured, like every morning, we all get here and we all chant whatever and we all do exactly the same bit in the workbook to being quite laissez-faire. So there's still a lot of, I think there's a lot of room for teachers within what mm. is there. Um, I mean, basically, most people are happy if you get them to read and write. Yeah. Now, one of the biggest problems with Montessori, as you were saying earlier, is getting finding qualified teachers. Right, and, and you've been involved with helping to uh, find a solution for that in, in your work with Montessori Institute or MWEI as it was then. Yeah. Can you tell yeah. us about how you got involved there and, and what that, that group okay. looked like in the early days? Okay, well, again, probably um, I got involved when I was principal of Beehive because they were training teachers um, through the correspondence through uh, London, anyway. It was my, my, mostly correspondence at that stage until, um, oh, what's her name? Was that Humphrey? Humphrey. Yeah. yeah, came out to Australia and ran some courses oh, yeah. and trained a few people here. I, I wasn't one of those, I came along later, but I had done my monastery training in London, as I said. Um, and really it was just, we needed teachers. They were they were offering training, so I, I would start to send people their way, and then they invited me to be on their board, and um, so I was on their board for a while, and then um, I, I became the, the uh, Beth Alcorn was the educational director, and when she retired, I became the educational director after her. But it was all it was really just about training, giving people enough understanding so they can get into classrooms, run the classrooms and learn a bit more as they go. It's more the old apprenticeship system, really. Mm. What was it like um, it, when you started it, be, among Montessorians? How was the Montessori community? Was it divided? Was it very cohesive? Um, well, in WA, as I said, because I guess because the Montessori Institute was fair, was based here at that time, and also um, like my school, the Beehive, we we were like one of the biggest schools, and we had people with all kinds of training. We had AMI people, we had people who'd done Indian training, we had people who'd done 
South African training. We had people who had done, um, I don't know, well, I've forgotten, but all of, so all of the Irish training, yeah. we had all of those and people, you know, people were just very tolerant and got on and we didn't care where your training came from. Yeah. Uh, we did find in the early days, I remember being at a dinner, with MAF, one of the, about 2007, I suppose, and um, we were all sitting at a table and somebody said, oh, and where did you do your training? And um, I didn't say in London, I said, oh, I did it through the Montessori Institute because that's where I did my training for six to 12. Mm -hmm. And they literally turned their back. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of that from, especially in the Eastern States where it was very strongly AMI. It was a lot of um, uh, snobbiness, I will, I will say. But um, so I could have said I was AMI and you would have talked to me, this person, but... So, yeah, so I think in the early days there was a lot. There's still a bit of it around, and I, it still grates when I see a school advertise oh, AMI, and I think, why are you advertising you want people with AMI qualifications? Why aren't you saying, I want really good AMI teachers, I don't care what they are? Mm -hmm. But anyway, so there's still a few schools that do that. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think... Your, your your work with Montessori Institute has really helped to break down that that snobbishness because you produce such well qualified teachers. Yeah, well, you know, as I said, the training I did was a year face to face, and as Philip knows, that's you know you get more immersed in it that way. So in some ways, um, it it would be the ideal training for everyone, but no one. No one today is going to be able to go to England for a year and do training. Schools can't afford for that to happen. So we have to do the best training we can that doesn't involve that. And we still have people face to face. Um, so we try and make up for it on those days where we do have them face to face, even though they're not like full time. Mm -hmm. Do you think technology, you know, since we've all become used to Zoom with the <laughs> pandemic, so do you think that that's a, a a good thing or a mixed blessing or a bad thing? Uh, it's, it's probably a bit of a mixed blessing. I mean, we we do some of our theory lectures now we had to do last year on Zoom because it was just like trying to get through it. Um, and we've had like a couple of cases one-on-one -on -one where someone's, you know, in order to finish their course, they needed, a, you know, a day on maths or something, but it just doesn't work. Um, Long term, you know, it's got to be face to face. I mean, it's concrete materials. If you can't get your hands on the materials, what can you do? Yeah. Is there, it, what, if, if there's a book that you think all educators should read, what do you think that would be? Um, it, I was thinking about that because you, gave me the heads up that that would be a question. Uh, I mean, like in the early days, I read The School on the Hill, which was the English one about like a school where there were no rules. And that kind of opened my eyes to what maybe teaching could be about. That's um, Summer Hill. Yeah. Yeah, it's about Summer Hill. I think it was called The School on the Hill. Yeah. Um, I can't remember what it was called. I mean, I wouldn't recommend that today because that's like, you know, it hasn't really lasted, but but back in the 70s and 80s, it was like pretty revolutionary. Yeah. Uh, today, what would I suggest? Um, I like um, the book uh, uh, that's um, the 6 to 12 book. It's Cosmic, what's it called? Uh, I think it's by Michael. Michael Duffy? Yeah. Mm. No, not Michael Duffy, Michael, the guy in um, America and North America. You know him, Mark. He runs the St. Catherine's. Michael you know, Dora? Oh, Ma Michael Dora. Michael Dora. Oh, yeah. He's got a book on cosmic education that's really okay. good. Mm. Um, but I think just to get an understanding of, of where Montessori is today, I think. Awesome. Yeah, the deep well of time. That's it. Thanks, Philippa. Thank <laughs> you.
the deep well of time. That was it. Um, oh, and I think Montessori's book too, um, uh, The Human po Potential, that was really influential as well. I love that book. Now, one, one of the things that I think, you know, you talked a little bit about burnout before, and, you know, well, that's one thing that's very chronic, I think, in, in the Montessori community is burnout among teachers. Mm -hmm. Have you found a way to manage that work-play, work-life balance that works for you? Um, no, probably not. I, I, think, I think people today are better at it. I think people in my day, you know, as I said, you know, influence. I was young in the 70s and the, coming out of the hippie generation where we thought as women, we had to be able to do everything. We could have a career, but we had to run the family and the house and the kids and everything else. So burnout was a big risk. I think looking at my own grandchildren today, they're much more balanced. They, they will draw the line much better than we did in those days. No. And they're not trying to prove that women can do everything. Mm. So you think Montessori had, had a your your career in Montessori had it had a um, some effects on your family and your family life? Um, oh, possibly you'd have to ask uh, my daughter that. But um, I've got one daughter, and she she um, she works for the Montessori Institute. She runs. Uh, workshop. She she runs a childcare centre. She's heavily into Montessori, and one of my grandchildren is as well. So mm. I don't think it had too bad an effect on. You know, my my twelve year old is always telling me to stop working. Coming, she comes down and closes the computer lid, and it's time to yeah, stop. Yeah, Well, as I said, I think when I was principal of Beehive, I worked out I was working about a sixty hour week. Yeah, you know, that's crazy, but you can do it when you're younger. I don't do it now. Um, does anybody in the any in the audience have questions? Feel free to unmute yourself and yeah, uh, yeah. Can I ask a question, Mike? Yeah, I feel. Um, <clears throat> Leslie, you and I have been around a long time, and we've seen the challenges of, of non-monastery principles. Yeah. Uh, Oh, I wonder, do you have a thought of how you train someone to be from a teacher to be a principal? I mean, particularly with the rigors of compliance and, mm -hmm. oh, I, I don't know how, to, I, I think, I mean, you know, I know Fiona has talked to you at length about this as well. What, what yeah. is, I mean, that's one of the challenges I think we all face in all our schools. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think today it's, it's Montessori yeah. principals as much as Montessori teachers because, um, I mean, like, like the original Montessori teachers, you can teach yourself a lot by doing a lot of reading um, and, and, and get there. I mean, the early Montessori teachers had like about six weeks with Maria and that was it. They were let loose. So I think, I think again, we've become a bit uh, patronising of Montessori adults and, and don't realise that they can actually teach themselves a lot. But when you've got a principal, oh, that's tricky because they do need a lot of those skills. They have to be able to deal with the bureaucracy. They have to be able to deal with all, all the oh and &S and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and are you going to get those people out of your Montessori classrooms from your Montessori teachers? Not a lot. I mean, there are some people who've, who've made that transition really well, but it is a really difficult thing. And I, I don't know the answer to that, Philip. I, I think Maybe what you do if you're interviewing a, a, for a principal is you try and find someone who has the right attitude to kids mm. and has the skills, the bureau, the governance skills, and then you educate them about what Montessori is. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. It's interesting because I think I, I really loved your chart that you were saying about how um, teachers kind of because I, I, I hear what you're saying that Montessori principals have to really be able also principals of a Montessori school have to be able to work with the children and the parents but I think they also have to gain the respect of the staff That's, yeah, I think, yeah. I think all the educators are often quite yeah. not that they want the job they don't, they don't want to be the principal but they they find it very hard when someone comes in who does not understand Montessori and yeah. I, and, and, I, and 
and and you you you're hanging them out to dry. Yes. Because as as soon as they challenge anything that the teacher's doing, the teacher goes, "Well, you're not Montessori trained. What do you know?" I mean, they probably don't say it in those words, but that's what they're thinking, and that's the, that's yep. what they're doing underneath it all. So, yeah, I think if you've got a, Montes- a principal who's not Montessori trained, you'd have to get them some kind of mm. training, some kind of deeper understanding of Montessori in some way, so that so that they can at least say to their staff, well, no, actually, I do, I do know what you're talking about when you're talking about the human tendencies or the fundamental needs. Mm. And it's particularly in the primary classroom, sorry to anyone wants to say something, yeah. but in the primary, in the, in the elementary, going from the six to 12s, if you've got teachers who are very experienced or teachers who are needing mentoring, it's really tricky if you don't have staff around you to kind of to, to fulfill that role and you have a principal who does it doesn't either no mm. no i i i, I, I see it's telling i see it as a big risk for, mm. for the mm. future i think we're failing each other as well because you know from all the years we've been working in i'm sorry I, I don't feel like we've we've actually been able to do that bit no I think. we've got teachers no, I, teach the children but the teachers to learn how to support their principals i think that's a I think we're very egocentric in our classrooms. I don't know what anyone else's thoughts, but I mean, Mark as well, you know, what do you think? I mean, like, Montessori teachers tend to be very focused around the children and in their classroom. And if you're lucky, they're colleagues with other teachers in other classrooms, but it's very mm. kind of, a principal comes in, you know, yeah, they're taking them out to dry. It's, it's really challenging because you don't want the school to go down for, because of that. No, no, it is, it is. I don't know the answer to that. I think it's... No. Okay. Somebody's there. Yeah, there's a PhD was, story for someone. I was just going to say, um, I, I love what you've said, Leslie, um, because I, it just resonates. Oh, hi, Elizabeth. Hi, <laughs> it just resonates with me all the way. But I really think it's the boards that, um, you know, they're the ones that hire the principals, and mm-hmm. they're the ones that um, really we need to work with. But that's a difficult. Uh, yeah. thing and, to do. Yeah. And, and the environment's changed, Elizabeth. When our school started, you could get away with being, you know, an ex-teacher who learnt on the job and learnt how to deal with the government and all that kind of stuff. Mm. But it's just got more and more bureaucratic and, you know, we just had someone the other day ring us, uh, one of our regulators going, now fill in this survey on survey on cyber security, and we went, "Oh my God, cyber security! What cyber security have we got?" And we all went into a tailspin, and now we've got to do training on cyber security. There's always something like that coming up. Yeah. yeah. Oops, one other Leslie. thing. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, Leslie. It's me. It's Hi. Annie. Oh, Thank hi, you. Annie. Hi, hi. Look, I just want, I suppose I can express my, um, our experience in this area that um, I wasn't from a Montessori background either. No, when I took no. the headship of your school, it was a situation where I had to sort of backtrack and learn a lot about and understand a lot about the Montessori um, ethos and the, how everything worked. But um, what we developed was a um, heads of departments of head, head of pre-primary, head of um, primary, head of high school who had the experience and the knowledge and they worked together with, yeah. with me and we de- worked through, because I was the business side with the operational side and made sure yeah. all that worked. And then we had this other three experts who, who worked. Well, Steiner schools work a bit like that. Mm. So my understanding, or well, they used to, I don't think they do so much now, but the, the principal of the Steiner school isn't really a principal. They're like the business mm. leader. And then the yeah. school, the teachers work underneath them. I, I'm not sure... Most of the schools I talked to, but this was probably 10, 15 years ago now, yeah. had kind of moved more to a, a traditional principal role because they just yeah. needed to. But, um, yeah, that I mean, if the school's big enough to have de- to have he- heads, that's a good way around it. That's right, and I, yeah. I think that's what's happening. Montessori schools are having to get bigger in yeah. order to do all of that. That's right. um, maybe we have to encourage them to amalgamate a bit more or something so that that sort of thing can happen. I don't know. Have you heard about Wildflower? About who? Wildflower is a network of very small shopfront schools in the US and it, it, uh, it, they get funding, 
but they're encouraged to have like to, for the teachers to do the administrative roles. So mm -hmm. they're encouraged to stay small and be very responsive to their community around them. That would be um, ideal, yeah. Apparently they're spreading quite rapidly mm -hmm. in the US. Yeah. I mean, it's different. It's one model. Yeah, no, I think somebody needs to do some research into all of that. Yeah. So, you know, a, a, a lot of us, um, you know, we get started in, in Montessori because we feel like Montessori can change the world. So in after, what is it, half century almost of being in education and Montessori, what do you think? Can Montessori uh, Yeah, as I said, I think we have changed the world in a lot of ways. A lot of the ideas have seeped out, um, probably not as much as we'd want to. Um, but I think Montessori per se changed a lot of things with her writing and with the different schools and the different... I mean, it's pretty worldwide, so I think that's impressive. Um, have we changed it as much as we want? No. Um, you're always going to get the, the, those people who who can't kind of come at come at it from the kind of philosophy where we do of, of you know following the child or or having trust in the child. They're always going to think that the adults know better. And that you, yeah. you have to have some kind of uh, thing imposed over the top, but I, I think you know there'll be two camps. It'll be a bit like you know the Trumpites and the Bidenites. You know, yeah. it's a different well, view of the, the world. It's that transformation of the teacher that's the trickiest part of training, I guess. Right? Is is it's yeah, not and that's interesting, isn't it? Because I remember having this conversation with someone. Who, who was AMI, and they, they said to me, oh, I think the difference is that, you know, our courses are about transforming the teacher. But then when I talk to them a bit and listen to people talk about their trainers, I, I don't know that I'd want them transforming my teachers because a lot of them can be quite um, acerbic. They can have people in tears. They, can, they, they don't tend to treat adults the way they tend children in a lot of cases, older Montessori people. So I said, you know, I, I, I think like the child, we have to give the adults a bit of credit and say adults can change themselves. They don't need, yeah. you know, AMI trainers trying to mould them into some kind of little um, patty pan of, of what they think Montessori teachers should be. So, yeah, I think it is about transforming the teachers. But... Most, if, if they're going to be really good Montessori teachers, once you give them something to read and they read it and they go, oh, my God. It's a bit like we at one stage in my school, we had to take a whole lot of 10 and 11-year-olds into our upper primary or sink. And we had a group of six of them come in, never been to Montessori in before, before. And probably out of that six, five of them, you could see when they walked in the door, they went, oh, my God, this is what I've been looking for, for all my life. And they adapted really well. You know, some of the others we had to work a bit harder on. But they, they were allowed to flourish in the environment we gave them. And I think teachers can do that too. Mm. It's a hard one, isn't it? Because you can't really mandate transformation in anybody, in a, in a child no. or an adult. No. Um, but, it, but it is an important one part of, the, of Montessori training. Yeah, who was one that? of the things, sorry. Go ahead. Um, let, oops. Sorry, Leslie. I was just, I am really enjoying what's being said here. But one of the things when we're talking about teacher transformation is that I think it is through our learning and it is through come, you know, coming together and exactly what we're doing here is where we're sharing information and really shifting our mindset. We won't go away the same person as we've come to this today. And that's, that's what I think is where yeah. the beginning of the transformation begins. Yeah. And I think that 
within my school, I know that I probably am seen to be more in my own classroom space, but it's because part of it is sometimes protection. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm expected to do things which don't align with my training. And I'm AMS, so it is, I do understand exactly what you're talking about with the internal um, conflict within our group. That's been what I've found to be what really does my head in because I get find that I'm questioned on why am I not AMI trained? You know, you know, there's more job applications for AMI, AMS is looked down on. Yeah. And, you know, that's really hard. And, and I, I guess that's why I query when people say, oh, but AMI training transforms the adult. Because if they really did, they wouldn't be doing that. Right? <laughs> A truly transformed Montessori adult would not look on down on someone else because their training was somewhere different. And, and what I found when we had people from about, I think I added it up once, it was about six different trainings, is if you're open-minded and you encourage people, you go, well, you know, why, why do you think your training did it that way and mine does it this way? You can have a really good conversation about it and go, well, actually, I think I like your way better. I, that makes more sense to me. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the sort of adults we want, not ones who go, oh, no, this is the way I've trained to do it, so I'm going to do it this way come hell or high water. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. I've Agreed. Does anybody else have a question? We're we're getting down to the last five five minutes or so. Uh, my quick thing is, you've got North American training, you've got MWEI, you've got AMI. What's the bottom line in all of this? It's just whoever does their training. Whatever institute providing, it's following the rules and the, 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 the high quality Mont Maria Montessori training. If you're working and that's all you can do, for me, that's the most important thing because that's putting more teachers in our classrooms that's helping our children. And if we limit the training and we're incredible to run really tight programming, we're not going to get the teachers to come through. Yeah. And at the end of the day, the bottom line is going to be less children are going to have a Montessori education. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I remember once someone said to me, oh, I, I, I wouldn't send my child to a Montessori school because there's not one that's authentic enough. And I went, my jaw just about dropped out of my mouth because I was thinking, so you'd send them to a state school where the philosophy is completely different or a private school where it's even stricter? I mean, it just doesn't make sense. You know, okay, it might not be the best it could be. Nothing's ever perfect. If you're looking for perfection, then you might as well give up now. Yeah. And Maria herself, what did yeah. she do with her own child? Yeah. She mm. didn't stay with her whole child till they were 18 and educated him for the whole time. You know, she made sacrifices to do what yeah. she did. And if there isn't, if there isn't a better example of that, of how we can be flexible and we should be flexible, mm. um, we will then get more teachers, we will be able to train more principals and we will be able to grow this philosophy and really make a difference to our little ones to really help make the world change, I feel. Yeah, uh, I agree with you, Sam. It's, it's One of the things which I do like about the Regio approach is that they actually put it in the context of the community that they're within. Yeah. So it's more tailored, even though it is actually you're still following the principles and the philosophy, but the actual, there's differences between each one of them. And I think that, you know, one of the other problems actually, Leslie, I'm keen to know, our focus seems to be sometimes on the individual, yet the community seems really important. And I'm just wondering whether um, they're equal in that respect or like um, that we should be just focusing on the individual or what's your view on that? Well, I, I mean, it, it depends what kind of community your school's in because in a lot of schools, the kids come from everywhere, but they're not really coming from one community that they might travel across the city to go to your school. But I, I, th I think what you need is, is to build a community of, of learning with, within your staff. So if the teachers consider that 
that they that they don't know everything that they do need to learn that they do do need to learn from each other and you build this community of learners with your teachers hopefully it will slow down the other way um, but yeah I mean I think you can't run the same kind of Montessori school if you're running the school you know in in the um, Aboriginal outback in the in the middle of the outback with a lot of Aboriginal children right I, we, we had one of our, mm -hmm. our ex students do that and she said like the first thing she realised is that she had to do practical life day in and day out because these kids were coming to school with nets with not knowing how to take care of themselves. That was much more important than anything else she was doing. Whereas if you had a whole class of, you know, upper class, middle class kids, you probably wouldn't need to do that. So, yeah, it depends very much on the community of kids you've got. Mm -hmm. What I hear you saying, Leslie, is that transformation, a lot of transformation is about humility, learning and learning humility. And tolerance. <laughs> yeah, to, and the more, the more you learn, the more you realise you don't know. Exactly. Yeah. And what works with one kid will not work with another. You don't know, do you? And also working in harmony with, uh, like, for instance, uh, I've worked with many, many principals who have come from overseas and non-Montessori, but you know, you invite them into your class to observe your classroom and you, you build that relationship straight away. Yeah, so educate them. The, you know, I'm really enjoying this discussion because I've been through many big schools yeah. and now I'm in a completely different environment where my classroom is the only Montessori classroom. It's a mainstream school mm -hmm. uh, that really loves the philosophy. And I work in, I've been five years here now since I started the class and they're in awe of what Montessori yeah. can do. Yeah. So, yeah. Bernie, where's that? What school is it? So this is the Athena school. Uh, they they follow, uh, it's an independent school, very small, but Where? it's right uh, in Newtown in Sydney. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes, and so, so yeah, so they opened, they wanted to open this classroom. It's, it was a challenge for me. I took this up, I mean, it's after many, many years of teaching in a normal three to six classroom. It was challenging because we, I don't have the age, the three age groups. Mm -hmm. I basically have like two age groups only uh, because of the way we are uh, structured. Mm -hmm. And um, also you're in a mainstream school where the bell would go at different times mm -hmm. of the day. They very, mm -hmm. It's very laid back, but at the same time. So you have to adapt a lot to all of that. But, you know, for what, what I've done and the feeder, like from my classroom, they move on to the mainstream yeah. and the teachers are just so pleased. And no one it. should say that's not valuable, Bernie, because um, it, it doesn't matter that you can't do the full three to six or that you, you have to stop because there's a bell. Okay, you'd rather not. But, you know, kids are, kids are amazingly adaptable. You can yes, work Exactly. And the yeah. resilience, you know, you build them up. To, it's to us adults who find it harder. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we could we could go on all evening. I think this has been a really great conversation, but we do have to wrap it up. And uh, I, I thank you once again, Leslie, for, for joining us. And sure. um, I will transcribe the interview and edit it down so that it can be published for people who weren't here. Um, please join us again in a couple of weeks on the 21st for, uh, I'll be interviewing Chip De Lorenzo, who wrote the book uh, Positive Discipline in the Montessori Classroom. Mm -hmm. um, and next week, we also have a special one-off session with Pam Statton to uh, finish up her work with um, ESF. Mm -hmm. so thank you, everyone. And thanks again, Leslie. Okay. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark, for coordinating it. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.